Hi everyone and welcome to Bio 107. So this class focuses on the evolution of life. My name is Lynn Carpenter and I'm going to be your instructor this term. Lectures of course are supposed to technically be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 3 to 4.50 but we know it's remote. And so what I'll be doing is I'll be uploading them and you guys can listen to them when you have time. My one suggestion to you is that um, your summer term moves really quick, okay? So make sure you guys stay on top of them and you don't fall behind. Office hours will be on Mondays from 11 a.m. to noon. We'll be doing them through Zoom, okay? And that way you can address any questions you might have. So the textbooks, um, The History of Life by Richard Cowan, if you're interested. Uh, technically, it's required-ish, okay? But realistically speaking, you can survive without it. It's just sometimes nice to have the information presented to you in a different form. Um, additional books, and these are just suggestions, um, Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin and Gorgon by Peter Ward, just to give you an idea of what science is really like. So just to tell you a little bit of information about me, my research um, from grad school tended to focus on white spruce and trying to determine how spruce trees responded to climate change in the past by looking at modern genetic patterns. This was actually really cool because then I got to drive to Alaska and yes, I said drive. <laughs> and so um, I, we ended up, um, a friend of mine and I drove to Alaska together and back. We covered 14,000 miles in three weeks, and fortunately, the rental car companies just released their unlimited mileage um, programs then, and so we took advantage of it, and honestly, I thought the car company was going to faint when we turned our car back in, and it had 14,000 miles on it, So, but it was definitely an awesome trip, and um, I love my research, and it was a lot of fun. So I graduated um, from the University of Illinois with my PhD oh, <coughs> a few years ago. <laughs> And then I was a postdoc um, at the University of Notre Dame and then also at McMaster University where I was trained in ancient DNA research and that part was actually pretty cool too. Um, I will tell you that Jurassic Park, watching that movie, kills me. Um, <laughs> we, we might have an opportunity for extra credit to have you guys critique the movie and you can say, talk about all the things that they do wrong in the movie um, with regards to ancient DNA. It's hard for me to watch it given the training and that's me on the right by the way in the white suit um, that's actually how you do ancient DNA research okay so not um, not the way that the movies actually show it but it definitely was a lot of fun and um, I enjoyed my time when I was there so the first thing we'll talk about today is the syllabus and then um, in the uh, later on we'll talk about a brief introduction to course topics course outline um, your project that you're gonna do and then if you guys are always welcome to email me if you have any questions or concerns. I realize we're online now, which makes things a little bit more challenging, but I'm always, you know, online and available if you guys need me, so just ask me anything. Okay, so you will notice that this has absolutely nothing to do with class, but I thought it was funny. Um, now what I want you guys to do is to pause lecture and go take a look at the syllabus, okay? So what the syllabus does is it gives you an idea of what topics we're going to go over. Keep in mind things might change up a little bit. We're just going to do the best we can. Um, it will also tell you that you guys have four quizzes this semester, and the idea of the quizzes is to get you ready for the exams, okay? So you'll have a quiz exam, quiz exam, quiz, quiz exam. Um, and the quizzes are sort of like a precursor to the exams and again it's meant to have you test your knowledge and see where you're at and so forth and what you still need to study. Um, exams and quizzes and all that are all open note, open book, okay, and so the more you know the material though the quicker you guys can get through it. Um, and so definitely it's worth your time to go through. You are required, by the way, to start answering questions using lecture material. Do not Google everything. I won't accept it. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I know that trick. <laughs> so the way the quizzes and exams work is I will ask you a question, and then you will be required to answer it. Um, start with the lectures first to answer it, and then you have to tell me what slide number and what lecture number that the information came off of. You're welcome to use outside sources as long as they're reliable. Okay, so .edu, .gov, hopefully those are all reliable. So you can use those sources, but you've got to focus mainly off of what we talk about in lecture. Okay, you also have what's called a um, project. And there are four different stages to the project, and they're basically meant to offset if you happen to have a bad day. Okay, so if you happen to have a bad exam. Um, and everybody has those days where things just kind of go <clears throat> And so what the um, project does is, is lets you be creative. Okay, you can use whatever media you're interested in. And you can pick a topic that we're going to start addressing. 
but that you want to learn more about. So we're covering a ton of information in a short amount of time, and it's impossible to learn everything. I don't know everything. I'm not even going to pretend I know everything. Anybody who does is full of it, okay? <laughs> so, um, however, we're going to do the best we can to cover as much information as we can. But, um, you know, there's a lot of it. So you're going to pick a topic that you're interested in that you want to learn more about, and you will focus a project on that particular topic, okay? So it's low stress. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to help you learn. And um, the four different parts add up to an exam grade. So that's like a total of 500 points, I think, for the class. And that we'll have opportunities for extra credit if you guys are interested in it. But if you guys are listening to lecture and you're learning and you're paying attention, everything's going to be fine. Okay, so my suggestion would be to download the PowerPoint slides before lecture and then um, go through the lecture, which I'm going to record online because I've had students say they prefer it that way because then they can, you know, go back and re-listen to things. And then if you guys have questions, you can always just come chat with me during office hours. If you can't make office hours because you have something else going on, just send me an email and we'll figure something out, okay? One thing I can't always control, by the way, is the fact that sometimes the slides I pull into this program will look slightly wonky, and that's not intentional. I don't know how to fix it. Um, and when it comes to recording this, I choose to use this particular program, Adobe Captivate, just because it works really well. But I apologize that the format is sometimes a little off. So make sure you download the PowerPoint slides first, and then that will make sure there's no issues. So the evolution of life is a really big topic. We're talking about 4.6 billion years of history, guys. Billion. Older than me. <laughs> okay. So um, basically, we have to cover over 100 million years each lecture. And that's a lot of information. And you can't cover everything. You can't even come close to that. But just realize that we're doing, you know, we'll be talking about the Cliff's Notes of the Cliff's Notes of the Cliff's Notes version of Evolution of Life. Okay. So we can't hit everything, but we do the best we can to hit the big points. So we're going to be focusing on the origins of life and how it's changed or evolved through time. And so currently we really do take this knowledge for granted. Um, but remember, people didn't always have the knowledge that we have today. Okay, so first we'll talk about the different fields that investigate, you know, this particular topic. And then we'll talk about how researchers and scientists tend to look at patterns and processes that go on. And the whole idea is that if you can figure out what happened in the past, it might give you a glimpse of how things may or may not go in the future. Nothing's perfect. Can't always have everything perfectly. Okay, but it does give you some knowledge, which is actually pretty cool. Okay, guys, now I do a lot of interactive things, even though we're remote, because it would seriously be boring for me to sit here and yammer at you the whole time, and that's no fun for anybody, okay? So I want you to pause lecture in a moment, okay? And I want you to write down the fields of science that will focus on or that do contribute to the study of life's history. So stop and think about it a moment, figure out what fields of science help to study life's history, and then once you're ready, go ahead and hit play again and start up the lecture. Okay, so this is not a comprehensive list, meaning we're leaving off a lot of things, but this gives you an idea of some of the fields that do study life's history. One example, plate tectonics. This was actually one of my favorite topics when I was a kid and still is, as far as how the plates of the earth move around. Um, they actually move around, believe it or not, two centimeters per year, and that might not seem like a big deal, but guys, we're talking the plate of the earth that we are sitting on moving two centimeters you can see two centimeters how cool is that that's pretty cool okay so they move around quite a bit considering the fact it's more than two miles of crust okay it's the shifting around paleontology of course looking at fossils i don't know about all of you when i was growing up as a kid i was always looking for fossils i still always look for fossils okay if i happen to be in a quarry of some sort um, or if I'm in a gravel road, I'm always looking for fossils. It's just a habit I've been in since I was a kid. Paleoecology, which is an area of science that kind of pieces together past environments, which is very cool. Okay. Systematics. Now, systematics is basically the study of what species are related to who. Okay. And so um, you can use, you can investigate this using either molecular biology, which is like looking at the genetics or the genes, or looking at how morphology has changed over time. Okay, so there's other ways to study this as well, which is pretty interesting, but this just give you an idea. And of course, evolutionary biology. Now, when I was a undergrad, long, long ago, <laughs> as my husband would tell me, um, in a very different life, um, at my school they didn't even have evolutionary biology as a topic you could study. And if I'd found that, I'll be honest, my grades would have been so much better. Because <laughs> I love evolutionary biology and I've always found it fascinating because you're looking at how things change through time. But when I was an undergrad, you either majored in zoology or botany. 
okay? They didn't even have biology. You had to pick one of the two, and I was a zoology major. And, you know, eh, kind of like my major, but really evolution to me is the most fascinating thing. But ultimately what you're looking at is change through time, okay? And this can happen in a couple different ways. This can happen through what's called macroevolution and microevolution. And we'll talk about that in more detail on the next slide. So there are two different levels that you can study evolution. Okay, the first is called microevolution, and this is the one that everybody tends to focus on. So microevolution is looking at how individuals within populations are selected for or against. So it's selection at population level. Write this down, you won't have a chance to do it again. Natural selection at the population level. Okay, so it's looking at what happens to individuals over time and who's successful and who's not successful. That's microevolution, so you're looking at within a population. Macroevolution, which scientists have been debating on even for decades, and I think there's not as much debate anymore. They've kind of accepted that macroevolution is a thing. But what that does is macroevolution is looking at evolution above the species level. Write this down. Okay, so macroevolution is looking at evolution above the species level. So if a lineage is successful from a macroevolutionary perspective, then there will be a whole bunch of species coming off of that lineage write this down too. If it's not successful, then the whole lineage goes extinct. Okay, so make sure that those two different ideas make sense to you, and if they don't, let me know. So microevolution again, process occurring at or affecting individuals within populations, macro gene frequency changes due to natural selection, genetic drift, all sorts of other good stuff. Macroevolution is when you have processes occurring at or above species level, and so, you know, a lot of times you've got major morphological change, and very often this can explain large patterns in the fossil record, okay? So, make sure that you can distinguish between the two. I love to do compare and contrast on quizzes, okay? And then if you have any questions, let me know. By the way, just so you guys know, if I ever ask you to compare and contrast something <coughs> on upcoming quizzes, <coughs> you should know this, by the way, compare means you have to talk about how they're similar, and contrast means you, talked about how, you talk about how they're different. Okay, so, and that's what you should always do for compare and contrast. Make sure you talk about how they're similar, and then talk about how they're different. Okay? Now, patterns and processes and evolution. So, biotic change is when you have interaction of life with processes, and this is basically what's influenced our story. So there's a relationship between microevolution and macroevolutionary change. We'll talk about that later this semester. We'll talk about extinction. So cool and sad, but cool simultaneously. And then we'll talk about the complexity of life. Okay. In fact, actually on the next slide, we'll even start with the complexity of life and talk about some different ideas that people may have. Okay. So when it comes to the complexity of life, okay, so we have the beginning of life. And from that, the prokaryotes formed. And by the way, prokaryotes are the single-celled bacteria in archaea. From them, eukaryotes evolved. Okay? And then being multicellular evolved. And then plants and animals came about. And then finally later on, humans about 200,000 years ago, fashionably late by the way, <clears throat> made our appearance. Okay, now there's a lot of different things that impacted our evolution along the way. There's a lot of different conditions like biotic factors and abiotic factors. So what I want you to do now is to consider what biotic factors might influence life evolution. Also consider what abiotic factors might influence the evolution of life. Biotic factors, things like predation, competition, okay, abiotic factors, temperature, weather, moisture, all sorts of the, you know, natural disasters, those will all impact life. And as we'll talk about in the beginning of the class in the next few lectures, it's actually pretty interesting because um, Earth's initial history was pretty violent and that most likely delayed the evolution of life for billions of years. Okay, so I always say if you invent a time machine, be very careful where you go. Because <laughs> if you go back too far, it's not going to be pleasant. If you hit the time during what's known as the bombardment, Earth was getting a bunch of asteroids slammed into it. And that is not a good time to go. <laughs> so let's talk about the patterns and complexity of life. So what's wrong with the idea that critters always evolve? from least complex to more complex, so that they always evolve into more complex critters, basically that evolution is unidirectional. 
What's wrong with that belief? Pause lecture here and think about it. Okay, so if life always evolved from least complex to more complex, would we still have bacteria around? Absolutely not. Would we have viruses around? Absolutely not. Okay, so um, selection and evolution, that, you know, evolution is what it is, and it just depends on the conditions and so forth as far as how creatures changed and, you know, how they change through time. So remember, we would not have any more prokaryotes if it was always going from least complex to more complex. Scientists love to debate, and so the scientist in me always chuckles, and then the other teacher in me tends to roll my eyes, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but they always love to debate. And so one thing that they debate on is if you're to go back in time and change things, okay, would the outcome be completely different? And the best thing I can liken this to is, I don't know if you guys ever watched The Simpsons or watched The Simpsons as you were growing up, and there was an episode where Homer was in a time machine, and he traveled back in time and sneezed on something, and it killed all of life and when he went back to normal his normal life his family was you know uh, changed very drastically and so he had to keep going back in time to try and fix things and he would go back ever so gingerly step on a butterfly he'd come back and his family would be I don't know monsters or something like that so you know it was very it was a very funny episode and so Stephen Jay Gould said that if we were to rerun the tape of life the outcome is most likely to be very different. And so there'd be very different critters, very different species, very different everything. And so this kind of aligns with that, and this is an argument that he happens to have regarding this topic. Now, other scientists, though, don't necessarily feel the same. And this is why I kind of roll my eyes, because scientists love to argue over everything. And I get to say this as a scientist, by the way. <laughs> So um, Simon Conway Morris, by the way, felt very differently that history would have been broadly similar, whether it had end, you know, started up after the Cambrian, maybe not identical, um, but it would probably follow a similar trajectory, even if there had been, you know, if you'd gone back in time and started to relive things. Now, the reality is, guys, is we don't have a time machine, okay? We can't be Homer Simpson, and we can't go back, thank heavens, <laughs> we can't go back in time and, you know, try to change things and see how that would tweak everything, okay? So, but it is an interesting way to think about things, you know, would we have ended up similarly or different had our trajectories, you know, gone about a different way? So if you actually apply this then, let's say that you had the origin of life and prokaryotes evolved and eukaryotes evolved. Well, what happens if we had been slammed by asteroids and multicellularity had never come about? Okay, would we have gone a very different direction? It's impossible to say, but again, what it does do is make us appreciate the knowledge that we have, the way things have gone, and, you know, kind of make you think about things in a different light, which is always pretty cool. Okay, so let's talk about some patterns and interesting things that can happen in evolution. There's, there's this um, event called convergent evolution, okay, where you have two different, completely different species, have not been related in billions of years, but they have similar traits because they're, those traits are useful, okay? And wings are a great example of this. So wings in birds, um, from an evolutionary perspective, came about very differently than wings on insects, okay? But you can obviously see that there's a lot of benefit to flying, okay, and flight. So for that reason, you can have different traits that will evolve in a different manner but give you the same outcome. But what I don't want you to think is that, um, you know, like bees and birds are closely related to one another because they both have wings because that is not the case, okay? So from an evolutionary perspective, they don't share a common ancestor with wings. Physiologically speaking, their wings evolve very differently, but just realize that you can have a situation where they have similar traits because of the fact it's convenient. You can see why there'd be a lot of benefit to being able to fly. You can escape predators, you can go get prey, and, you know, all sorts of other good stuff. Okay, so let's talk about the class overview. The way the class is structured is that we'll go over some of the basics first. So we'll talk about geologic time and radiometric dating and fossils and extinction, a lot of the mechanics of the evolution of life, okay? Most likely we will have two lectures a day because remember if we were sitting in class we would be there for two hours. And so what I try to do is break this up though so you have one one-hour lecture and then a second one-hour lecture per day. So it's not as if you guys, you know, have to stay in the same spot. When I find interesting bits of information, I'll forward that to you guys too, just because it's good for you to see what is going on in science of the field and all sorts of other good stuff. But so that's what we'll start with, though, is a lot of the um, technical aspect of the studying the evolution of life.
The other reason I want to have you guys go through two lectures a day is because I know you all are paying a fortune for this education, okay? And I want you to get your money's worth, all right? And so um, some days it might just be one if things are a little wonky or something like that. But we have so much fun stuff to cover. It's just hard for me to take stuff out, you know, because there's so much cool stuff to go through here. And we're talking about how life evolved. I mean, it's so fun. Who doesn't want to know where they came from? Well, okay, anyway. <laughs> okay, we will then focus on, once we get the mechanics done, we'll focus on the l less complex critters, okay? So the prokaryotes, where life originated from. Then we'll work our way up to the eukaryotes and then the multi-celled critters, which, you know, is obviously where we happen to fit. Then we'll start getting towards the more complex critters like the fish and the tetrapods and the reptiles and the, the dinosaurs and the mammals and the Cenozoic and all sorts of other good stuff, you know, so many topics to cover and goodness, not even remotely enough time. Then as we get towards the end, we'll tie all these evolutionary concepts together, both looking at biotic, like natural selection, competition and so forth. And, and then add in the effects of abiotic change, meteorites slamming into your earth, climate change, all sorts of other good stuff. And, um, you know, again, so much fun stuff to cover, not, not even remotely enough time to get it in depth. But we'll do our best and we'll definitely have a lot of good stuff to talk about this term. So it should be fun. Oh, look, a practice quiz question, a.k.a. something to think about. Does the process of evolution always go from least complex to more complex? And what evidence do you have to support your answer? If this was to appear, to appear <coughs> on an upcoming quiz, <coughs> hint, hint, did I mention hint? What I want you to do is answer this question and then go back and say what lecture it's from, obviously number one, and what slide it's from. I'm not giving you that answer both. <laughs> okay, so what I'm trying to do is teach you all how I think and what I think is important and so forth. And so again, there's no stress in this class. The whole purpose is to have fun and have you guys learn, okay? All right, so that's it for this particular part of the lecture for today, and then we'll go ahead and go to the next one. If you have any questions, let me know.